Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, and joining me, as he does every week, is Arusha Paris. He is a portfolio manager over at O'Neill Global Advisors. How are you doing this evening or afternoon, Arusha? I'm doing well, Justin. Yeah, still trying to decide what it is. I'm about yeah. to change time zone, so you know, I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to get get in the groove. I'm uh, actually going to be going in the neck of the woods of our guest, Kathy Donnelly, uh, one of our favorite IBD podcast guests. She's also one of the co-authors of the Life Cycle Trade, along with our friends Eric Kroll, Eve Bobach, Kurt Dale, and uh, that, that's everyone, right, Kathy? I didn't miss anyone, did I? Nope, Eve Bobach, okay. Eric Kroll, and Kurt Dale. You got yep. it. Okay, I got them all. Okay, so welcome back to the show, Kathy. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited for you to experience our very cold weather right now. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, my, my wife was looking at the weather, and it's apparently negative 7 degrees, uh, which I didn't realize was actu actually like a real thing. Um, well, that'll be at night. Okay. It's only that'll be at night. Okay. 7 right now. Well, well, again, just the fact that it gets that cold anywhere in the world is amazing to me because I've never actually experienced that myself, uh, any below zero temperature. <laughs> so Bring this will be a new cap. one for me. What's that? Bring a ski cap. Okay, perfect. I will uh, I will make sure that I do that. So, of course, you know, since the life cycle trade is really kind of uh, one of Kathy's specialties is getting into the IPOs and kind of finding these and understanding how they maneuver and uh, what what they look like from the start to finish. Uh, we're definitely going to get into a lot of that and a little bit about how that kind of overlays with our current market, where we might be in this current cycle uh, of that life cycle, if you will. So uh, we've got a lot to talk about. So I guess let's go ahead and get right into it. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and take a look at the NASDAQ composite here. And, um, you know, we had a really strong start to the year in January. It was almost like, hey, is it is it a bull market again? Happy days uh, and all that after a lot of false rallies and bear market rallies in 2022. Um, but what what's your take now, Kathy, now that we've kind of pulled back, we're back under the 21 day moving average line, uh, the exponential 21 day moving average line on the NASDAQ. Uh, holding above the 200 day for now, but uh, what's your take? Yeah, you know, Justin, it, you're exactly right. It, it felt like, oh my gosh, we're we're finally in a in a bull market and, and things are finally working. I'm I'm actually making a little bit of money, and then the last <laughs> few days and weeks, it's like, oh no, we're back into that <laughs> volatility again, and everything's rolling over, and oh no. So I I totally get what you're saying. Um, yeah, and, and 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 I've shared this before. I like to look at the 10-day moving average and the 21 exponential moving average and see what they're doing. And they're both trending down now, which is always not a good sign. And as you mentioned, we're more than one percent below the 21 exponential moving average as well. And so for me, that's a, a red light situation. Definitely caution. Uh, you know, I was starting. I was during this whole entire time when. The market had been going down. There were some bottoming bases. We're going to talk more about that. And I was trying some maybe some one percent positions. Mm -hmm. And then when the market looked good, like you were describing, I was like, oh, maybe I can put some more money in. But now I feel like I need to go back to that one percent. But one thing I did also want to share with everyone that I noticed is that the 200 day moving average is still trending down. Yeah. It, it's trending up on the weekly chart, but it's still trending down on the daily. So. We really need to see that go up as well. I mean, the short term, 10 and 21, you know, they're they're flexible. They, they can turn around quickly, but we got to get that that 200 day going back up. And then I'm going to feel a lot better about it. I mean, 12,000 is, you know, it's a nice big round number and, and we're struggling to stay above it. Yeah. So, Kat, so Kathy, how far did the market pull you in with, with your exposure over, uh, you know, starting January all the way up to, you know, the middle of February? That's a great question, Arusha, and it pulled me in a lot. Um, mm -hmm. At the, let's see, the end of December, January, I was starting to try a lot of 1% positions off the bottom, okay. mainly because, you know, I was bored. But then also when I was thinking about, <laughs> <laughs> I was bored, okay. I, 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 stock market, I miss you. Let's, yeah, let's get together so. again. Uh. You, I miss you. Um, but, so what's a way I can, I can get in, test the waters and, and maybe get some action, you know? So mm -hmm. yeah, I was, I was testing the waters with some bottoming positions where the, I, cause I've seen a lot of gap ups from the yeah. bottom mm -hmm. earnings. Yeah. And when you think about the whole year, 
and you know the top stocks for the year they all have to start somewhere and they don't yeah. always start at the 52 week high they start on the bottom so i thought well if i just put some one percent positions on and i know where i'm going to take my losses it's it's not really going to hurt me so i had like a bunch i don't remember how many i had of one percent but they were all working and next thing yeah. you know i was up like 10 you know 10 15 percent on these one percent positions and i was like wow this is this is really wild so then when the market actually did start working and then i put even more money in i was like it was almost like just out of control i had to pull myself back to make sure i didn't go too crazy so it's been uh, a while right so so we, we you know you can forgive yourself for that exactly but the thing is is you know we have rules that we follow if we all have you know risk and it's risk management so I'm not just like going in blindly and then, you know, letting them all go get back down to 20% negative. You know, the rule is you cut your losses at seven to eight percent and I'm not going to round trip gains. But what it did for me doing that is I really got a good feel of the market and I could feel the volatility. And actually, I'll, I'll, I'll say I was actually using a 10 percent stop loss. And the reason why was because of the volatility. And I actually wasn't getting stopped out with that 10% loss by Friday. So let me clarify mm -hmm. too, because it could have been negative, more than a negative 10% on like Wednesday, but because everything was so volatile, it was coming back on Friday. So I actually didn't get stopped out that often. And I was really surprised. So mm -hmm. I've pulled back now, obviously, because again, some of them, these are, were getting more volatility. I think um, some of the stocks that went up, you know, from these earnings gaps, that have I have a little bit of cushion in their building new basis. So what I hope to do is then if the market will prove itself, then I can put a regular size position on top right. of that one percent from another a more legitimate uh, first stage base, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And where did you go from the one percent? What was kind of the next uh, percentage of position? So you got more confidence. You had a number of these positions that were up 10, 15 percent. Did you increase your starting positions at that point? No, because I oh, wanted to wait for a solid base. You know, okay. I didn't want to, okay. you know, it was kind of like, okay, these 1% positions are working, but I don't want to just start throwing more money in until I had more confidence. Okay. And okay. it happened so fast when the market turned around. It was almost like, you know, I was like maybe three, five, and the next thing you know, it was up to 10. But yeah. I, do, I still don't want to buy extended. Okay. Even though I'm trying the 1%, I'm still trying to follow the rules where I'm buying at proper buy points. Mm -hmm. And in my head, it was like, okay, I need a base here before I can really start adding in because these could still roll over very fast. And if I put more money into it, then I'm really going to be into trouble. Yeah. So. And we certainly saw, you know, you mentioned how there were just a lot of stocks that were gapping up. And that was one of the things that attracted you. It certainly seems like we've also had the other side to your volatility point. We've got a, a lot of stocks that have had these landmines that just, you know, gap downs, whether on news, we just went through earnings season. So it's it's been a little treacherous out there. You know, I've got a great example for you. Uh, Shopify. Shopify. Okay. Yeah. Uh, from its it, it, it is a base, you know, it's at the bottom, there's a lot of overhead, but it it, um, it, it went up, I, I put in a 1% position, and it's it has reversed, it's come all the way back down, and it stopped out. But in this case, I actually didn't wait till Friday, because you could tell the market was, mm -hmm. was heavy, it was pulling things down, I was still um, above, I was still in a profit zone of a few percent. So I went ahead and cut it. Yeah, but at least I kind of got in there if it worked. Mm -hmm. So that's a good example of kind of what I was doing and playing around with. And also one, one more thing, just to kind of clarify, because you said you had all these 1% positions. <laughs> how, how many stocks are you owning? Uh, I, and again, this might have not been indicative of how you usually trade because, uh, you know, it was still kind of, let's see, let's do these pilot positions, see if things, you know, are getting some traction. Um, but how many, how many stocks did you get up to and how much is your normal? Well, that's a great question also. And let me clarify that, yeah, this is not something I normally do. It was literally a brand new thing that I came up with when I was thinking about what I wanted to do with my trading for the next year and how I wanted to just like get back in the market and what would be a good way. And it was just it just kind of like came to me. So um, I had a, at least I had a 10 positions at one point mm -hmm. in those one percent positions. 
Okay. In general, a normal bear market, I mean, bear market, excuse me, a bull market, I want to start with a 10% position. And my right. ultimate goal is six to eight stocks, you know, with a concentration, mm -hmm. not a diversification. But a lot of times you will start off, or at least for, for me, a lot of times I will start off with 10%, uh, 10 positions. They might mm -hmm. be a little bit smaller or there might be a number of, you know, 5% positions initially or, or things like that. And the goal is to, to kind of narrow that down from 10 to six positions or something. Right. I've actually never been very good at that, but it's funny you bring that up because I was starting to feel like, oh, I'm like one of those people that kind of, you know, cast that wide net and now yeah. I got to whittle it down. So I, mm -hmm. I found myself in a new situation, but it was an exciting one. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, something to add to, uh, you know, my rules and because yeah. you know, we're always evolving, right? And the markets mm -hmm. are always different every year. So we have to evolve and give what they're giving us or take what they're giving us. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the IPO market. And again, if we're if we're in a recovery phase, and you know, just because we've come down doesn't mean that the all hope is lost and you know start to despair. Uh, this could just be a run of the mill pullback that you know happens. Uh, so maybe talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of um, you know the recovery and what you expect here from from some of the IPOs. Well, I did a quick scan yesterday, and one thing I noticed is that there's not a lot of stocks IPOs in twenty from 2022 that are even liquid enough to trade. Mm -hmm. uh, there's like 15, I think, that are t over 20 million dollars a day, and there's two that's over 100 million. One of them being Mobileye, which I know we're going to talk about later. Yeah. So there's not a lot of good pickings, I guess, slim pickings from 2022. So I think we're definitely going to have to look back to see some IPOs that came out in 2021 and maybe even some that reinvent themselves from 2020. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely there's not a lot for 2023, you know, maybe like 20 something. And of course, they're too new to even know. Right. And they're not we don't have any great IPO advanced faces going on. Mm -hmm. So and what? Uh, Arusha has a slide that we're going to show that shows that the IPOs, you know, kind of lag a little bit, right? So if this year ends up being a great market year, we're not going to have really IPOs till later in the year, right? Because the IPOs, the companies need to know that we're in a strong market before they actually want to come out. I mean, Mobileye is like the exception, right, that came out in the worst of markets and there was a lot of confidence, but that's not generally the case. Mm -hmm. Um so, Arusha, do you want to go to that slide? The bull, Yeah, there we go. The current right there. So this slide was put together uh, by my co-author, Eric Kroll, and he was just showing, you know, that usually, uh, it, you know, you don't have a lot of IPOs that come out in, in bear markets. I mean, there's just not the demand, right? No one's really buying. You're, you know, you're doing the opposite and they want to push their stocks up. So. This is something I wanted to show. Of course, we have that amazing bar from <laughs> 2021. <laughs> yeah. So, so just to give everyone, you know, kind of perspective here, especially for those who are listening uh, to the podcast, and and when you get back to your computer, definitely go to investors.com/podcast so you can see some of these slides. But uh, in 2000, there were 397 IPOs that came out. In 2021, there was 1,035. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And and of course there were a lot of SPACs in there, the special right. Everyone was just rushing companies. Rush, right? Yeah, it's right. Um, but you know, to Kathy's point, uh, just to kind of describe this chart a little bit more for folks, um, you know, after that 397 in 2000, um, you had 141, 183, 148. So the next three years basically uh, kind of, you know, were almost as much as that one year in 2000. Right. And then you had the bull market, you know, back up to 300, you know, 300 IPOs a year for a while. And then the bear market in 2008, 2009 shrunk to 62, 79. And so now here we are after this big year of, as you said, 1,035 in 2022, we only had 129. So, so very big difference. Um, what other stats can you share with us, Kathy? Uh, about yeah, well, let's go to the next slide, Arusha. Mm -hmm. uh, first, let's just look at the ETF for the IPO Renaissance, the IPO Renaissance ETF compared to the NASDAQ and the S&P. And, and this should be no surprise. You know, we know from what we've learned from uh, Bill O'Neill that, you know, growth stocks usually, you know, go down twice the market. 
and here it's very clear the IPO market, you know, those are generally our growth stocks and, and they're they're down way more than the, the NASDAQ and the S&P at this point. Mm -hmm. So just another reminder. Now, the trend is similar. Right. But we would like to see them <laughs> all be going up into the positive at some point. Yeah. 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 Um, and then uh, what about some examples of what the IPOs have been looking like and um, everything? Huh. Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought that up. And this this points to just the chart we just saw. I mean, 91 percent of stocks IPOs will eventually undercut their day one price low. Okay. And, and which and is amazing. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's that because everyone, especially retail investors, I love to buy on the IPO day. Right. IPO day. Yes. They're trying to get in. I mean, I, I immediately think of Facebook right now. Uh -huh. Meta, but yeah. everyone was dying to get in that on, on the first day and that undercut pretty quickly. But here's the thing. Here's the thing that, you know, like if we think about like maybe value investors and, and folks that want to hold on like forever. Yeah. OK. This, there's no time frame on here. This is like literally eventually it could be in one year. It could be 10 years. You know, oh, okay. eventually That's interesting. It, yeah. it could roll over. I mean, if it's not a stock like Microsoft or Apple that really keeps reinventing itself, and mm -hmm. trying to change the way they live, work, and play, they're not going to make it. And we're going to and we're going to look at some of those. Um, and then I also wanted to highlight, you know, 11% of the IPOs hit their high within 10 days and never go higher. And with the market that we've had this last year, because it hasn't supported growth stocks, a lot of the IPOs that came out had a little bit of a run, and then they rolled over too. Yeah. So it's a very small percentage of successful stocks. I mean, when when Bill said, you know, you got to buy the top stock in the group, you have to buy the top stock. And then when he also said they don't always come back, well, there you go. 91% of them, you know, don't come back. Mm -hmm. So that includes the very successful stocks, including Upstart. Let's look at Upstart. Oh, actually, well, one hit wonder. I wanted to highlight that's one of our phases um, that we came up or pattern, uh, life cycle patterns that we came up in the book. But this looks just like Upstart, which is the next one. I want to mm -hmm. show that. And that line chart happens to be GoPro. GoPro. Oh, okay. That mm -hmm. one never never made yeah. it either but but just i mean i i don't need to tell you guys you know you do scans and and this is what we're seeing you know yeah. some and of start them was the stock that everyone was talking about in 2021 right mm -hmm. um and and the, we classified it as a one hit wonder it had a huge run huge yeah. run and then just undercut the whole thing and just like gopro did and and many others mm -hmm. yeah so let's just maybe take a look at a few others that uh Kind of had a similar look to that so i mean here's bumble yeah um, bumble you PMBL. know i remember having high hopes for bumble um and mm -hmm. i've talked to my friends and people that used it this one has a little bit different look this is kind of like that you know could fit that 11 percent goes up it's high in 10 days and never comes back i mean yep mm -hmm. there's that one and then the other one i wanted to show is unity the reason why i wanted to highlight unity is because there's this is a very common pattern I see out there when I'm screening. So it's a stock that, you know, had a nice little bit of a run, sort of started an institutional due diligence phase and wanted, you know, creating that first mature base, yeah. but then didn't have enough power to get to, to that institutional advance phase. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because with the index line being on there, you can see it was trying to go through right as the market was starting to roll over and then right. it just went with it and undercut cut the whole structure. Yeah. So it's it's rough times right now, and that's why we're going to be seeing a lot of overhead resistance that we're going to have to get through. There's, I feel like it's a very small percentage of stocks that are near their 52-week highs of the kind of stocks that we want to buy. Mm -hmm. Now, Kathy, just before we, we get into a little bit more of this, though, now for those 11% that ended up working really well, was did earnings play a big part in, in their success? Yeah, no, I, you know, we weren't able to research and tie earnings to the patterns and okay. the success of the stock. Yeah, we tried. Yeah. We did try when we were pulling all the data together. We really wanted to see. And, you know, but when we were putting all this data together, trying to find earnings data from stocks back from, you know, 1987. to yeah, it's, yeah. It's, that's challenging. It just wasn't something you could correlate. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, you look at it and you can we know anecdotally, I think, you know, just from all of our experience in stocks that we've seen over the years, it's, it's the earnings that really will catapult the stock and keep it And going. it's pretty rare, right? It's right. weird when you see an IPO come out and they have like really good earnings. It kind of sticks <laughs> out, right? Exactly. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. even Facebook, you know, that you mentioned earlier, it it wasn't until like a full year after its IPO that they had that one quarter where it was like, oh, we figured out how to monetize this now. This is more especially on mobile. On mobile, yeah. that that, that right. was really the catalyst for it. Right, and that's what it catapulted it up and started yeah. its institutional advance phase. And Tesla was the same thing when it yeah. broke out of its institutional diligence phase. It was on the news that they were going to have earnings. They actually yeah. didn't have earnings yet, but they said we're going to. And we're close. <laughs> well, yeah, they're they're like, yeah, we're actually kind of selling out of these ninety thousand dollar electric cars, and we can't, you know, everyone wants one. And so, yeah, and that's when the the stock really jumped up. Was that they were clearly exceeding their sales mm-hmm. expectations? Yeah. Um, so let's uh, we're we're gonna go ahead and cap off this segment. So just some final uh, thoughts before we get into the next segment. Huh. I think you had some bullets here. Yes. So um, did want to highlight as we close this out. So, you know, we're we're tied to what the market is doing, right? We've got market rules and that's what is going to keep the stocks down. Or it's going to help move them up. And right now we're going to be and we're going to focus on this in the next segment, as Justin said, we've got a lot of bottomy bases and first mature bases. That could be potential opportunities, but the market still may hold them down. And I've got some examples of that. Um, overhead resistance is a concern. And I know, you know, we like to buy close to near new highs, so we have clear sky to go, right. to go up into. But um, that's not going to be the case. But this is definitely the time to be vigilant, to be screening, and be ready. Because um, just like this quick little run that we had, now we're pulling back, but you had to be on it or you were behind. Yeah. And I just happened, I guess, to be lucky because at least I had some 1% positions going on. Mm-hmm. So stocks wait for no one and you just got to be ready. So um, your boredom worked to your favor this time. Yes, <laughs> it did. <laughs> so, okay. When we come back, we're going to get into a little bit more of what to expect in a recovery and what kind of rules you need to have uh, for such situations. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. The Direction Hydrogen ETF offers exposure to the top 30 pure play hydrogen economy companies by largest market capitalization, leading the way towards net zero emissions by providing more accessible, efficient, sustainable solutions across five hydrogen related sub themes. With clean hydrogen based energy expected to grow five times in the next 30 years, companies building hydrogen related businesses to generate power, heating, transportation, and more will likely thrive. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, and joining me as he does every week is Arusha Pires, O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager, and our special guest this week is Kathy Donnelly, one of the co-authors of The Life Cycle Trade. And of course, one of the big things that she's talking about in that book, along with her co-authors, is about IPOs and how they start and what they look like. So I guess the question is now, Kathy, we've had this, you know, 2022 bear market, uh, nothing was working or, I mean, there were things that were working, but growth was definitely getting hit really hard. A lot of the IPOs were just kind of decimated. So now the question is if, you know, as we recover from this, uh, as you recover from a bear market, how do you start climbing into these stocks? When do you get kind of the green lights and the go-aheads to start looking at these IPOs that could be these big future winners. Yeah, I'm really glad you asked me that. And I'm glad I'm here to, to share with the viewers how, how I approach it. Um, you know, every week, I'm always scanning all the recent IPOs from the last two to three years. And sometimes it goes really quick because like upstart, you know, those one hit wonders, it's just a downward trend line. So I can just quickly go by. But once I start to see uh, sideways action, then I start to get interested. And so we're going to look at some of those today and I'll share with you some things to look for and, uh, you know, how you how you can approach it. Because like we were saying earlier in the other segment, uh, you know, stocks aren't going to wait. And as soon as the market turns, they're going to go. So you need to be ready and have those alerts set. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can start with Mobileye. Uh, Mm -hmm. Ticker symbol here is MBLY. And of course, this is a this is a little unusual. This was a stock that was out there. It got bought. And then it had another IPO. This wasn't a spinoff. It actually was raising money um, for this, you know, this second IPO, basically. So um, what, what, what can you tell us about Mobileye and how you're viewing this pattern? Because it's very different from a lot of the other IPOs out there. 
it's very different. Um, and what I like about it is that we actually have an IPO advance phase. <laughs> mm -hmm. Most right. of the IPOs over the last year, you know, maybe made a little of a base and then from there just declined. And here, Mobileye, we have an example of where it created a short little IPO base and it, and it has a nice little, little trend going, an upward mm -hmm. trend. Now, people will say to me, oh, that's so volatile in there. And you, your cursor was right on it where I think the 10-week line, yeah, right in there. I mean, and that was yeah. volatile, but that's the nature of it. That's the nature of the IPO advance phase. It's a fast-moving stock for the most part. And so you have to expect that there's going to be those shakeouts. You know, for this one in particular, I was watching that 10-week line, 10, 10 week line, excuse me. And also, I do need to disclose that I do have a position in it. And I wanted to talk about it today because IPO advance phases usually don't last that long. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that Mobileye is not going to be continuing going up very much longer. And it's either going to create that due diligence phase that we've talked about many times, which we'll see um, more of those in other stocks a little bit later. Um, or it'll it'll make a nice little base and hopefully become a stair stepper pattern. And a stair stepper pattern is just as it describes, it, you know, just makes little patterns as it goes up and actually won't have an institutional uh, due diligence phase. Mm. So let's go ahead and look at the daily Arusha. So what I like when, I, when I'm focusing on IPO advanced phases, I'm really focusing on these short term, you know, trend lines, the 10 the 21 EMA, and then the 50-day. So you can see it's right now, it's very clearly holding the 50-day. It was a little volatile in there as it came back, as that line first started to appear on Marcus Smith. And that's one thing I'm looking for when I'm looking at an IPO advance phase. And then I'm watching how it acts with the 10 and the 21. So once it kind of came out of that volatility, it was holding the 10 day very nicely. Now it's having a little bit of trouble holding the 21 EMA. So when I look at this, when I start seeing that it's getting volatile between the 10 and the 21 EMA, from what I've experienced in just studying these IPO advance phases, it's getting a little tired. I feel like at this point, this is just my feelings, my experience, Not, <laughs> I'm not really predicting just what I've seen. I feel like it might have a little bit more room, but it's probably, oh my gosh. <laughs> going to be, you know, done soon is my right. opinion. Oh. I still have a position. I haven't trimmed it off. I'm waiting to see what it does up here. Um, but if it hits that 50 day, then mm. I'm for sure going to be out of it at that point. Mm. And then I'm going to be waiting to see, okay, is it going to be a stair stepper or is it going to go into a full fledged institutional due diligence phase? Mm. Okay. So taking a step back here, where, where's kind of the ideal entry for for mobile here because it was a little trickier right because this one was volatile it didn't uh it didn't spend enough time going sideways to form a traditional type of base that we all recognize uh so so using yeah so with mobile eye where would be kind of be the kind of the the entry that would be ideal well <laughs> and not or getting shaken out. Maybe it doesn't have to be exact ideal. Here's but, yeah. the thing I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I, I feel like uh, I feel bad because I don't remember where I bought it. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have to be where you bought it. it it's right. just like you're know, just looking at because it is such an interesting example because right. well, it was I'm, super volatile. I mean, well, even I'm, out of that IPO base, I mean, it went yeah. up 20% and then came all the way back down yeah. and gave it right. all up when yeah. it tested so, that, that 50 day. Right. Sorry. And 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 this is the thing with these IPO bases. So you see it initially broke out from the base and it pulled back. So, I mean, to me, that's normal, too. And so I feel like I say this all the time. And so I, I hope people don't feel like it's cliche, but I mean, it's true. You know, they break out and then they come back and they're all volatile and then they, they fake you out. And so I was probably I don't think I bought I'm pretty sure I didn't buy the initial breakout. But then when it shook out, I was buying it as it came back up because mm -hmm. just knowing that that's like normal and that's what happens. Right. I'm usually not very good at these U-turns. If you see kind of, you know, in the actual base where it made the U-turn and buying it as it was coming up. If I had done that, I definitely would have had an early enough position where I, I wouldn't have worried about. It coming back so when, when you say the u-turn you're are you, you're talking about right here in the kind of the, this yes base exactly this is it turns up from yeah you know, I mean, that was almost a, a picture perfect u-turn yeah. 
Yeah. Exactly. Like that would have been if you were like just on it and you're really yeah. good with, you know, um, you know, buying stocks quickly and, you know, on terms like that, then that to me would be like the best expert petition to buy. Otherwise, you have the actual buy point, which you would have gotten shaken out of potentially depending on how much room you gave it. But as it came back through that buy point, I feel like the odds of success are when it comes back through because that I see that all the time where it will break out and then fake you out and then right. continue up. Right. So if you're thinking that, again, because of that look of the 10 day and the 21 day um, and that this may this may be done for a while, um, do you, do you take some off? Uh, if, if you're thinking this might come all the way to the 50 day, uh, I mean, that's another, that's another 10% down. Right. Um, so, so what I would probably do, so I'm giving you my secrets here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's why we have you on the show, right? Uh, you're all the secrets. Uh, and this is what I do, but, um, and cause I studied on my own, this was independent of the research team, but I kind of like studied a lot of IPO advanced phases just on my own, just looking at the, the daily chart and seeing what they did. And what I have noticed is when, like I was explaining where it comes back to the 21 EMA, between the 10 day and the 21 EMA, it'll start to be a little volatile. And I'll call that in my head, I call it, it's dancing. It's like dancing okay. between those two lines. And usually I'll see like one more, like shoot up to a new high and then eventually after that it just rolls over so i'm what i'm ex hoping you know my precedent i guess would be that it will make one more new high and then it'll probably base into a, a regular base or go into that institute to diligence phase so when it makes that new high that's probably when i'll start taking off the top gotcha so maybe we can shift gears and go over to airbnb the ticker symbol here is a b and b and we maybe start on the weekly here as well. And this is an example of something that did come out, you know, really strong from its IPO. This was back in 2020 and it, it kind of went sideways for a little while. And then it really just seems like it got stuck underneath its 40 week moving average line for a while. Right, exactly. It got stuck. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is one that we call late bloomer just because it had that initial advance and now it's kind of created this very deep, institutional due diligence phase, pretty much marked from that prior high um, when it first IPO and then the, you know, the current bottom that it's made. So very, very wide due diligence phase, if you will. And, you know, probably I would say deeper than most because, I, you know, it followed the market. Right. Um, but now it's back above that 40 week line. So mm -hmm. this is where you've got that prior run up from the bottom. And it'd be really great to see now a constructive base, couple of handle, flat base, you know, maybe even a double bottom, depending on what the market gives us. Mm -hmm. You know, the first bottom it had there, it had to run up, but it just couldn't really form a constructive base. The 20, the 40 week moving average was still declining. Yeah, right in there. Thanks, Arusha. And then it made another low and now it's actually kind of made it above. So what I'd really like to see and, and that I'm glad you draw drew that red line at that um, big blue volume bar because that was on earnings. So that's yeah. a clue, right? Anytime we see big gap ups on earnings, even if they're not from bases, just within the base or within the structure, there's a signs of interest. Mm -hmm. So now we just need to see a constructive base, a good market. And then this is one I would definitely be, you know, wanting to put money in. I mean, it's got a lot of, O'Neill funds in it, which you're showing there on the right hand. Yeah. Uh, it's very liquid. Fidelity Contra Fund, Wells yeah. Fargo Contra Fund's been building a position yeah. for the last few quarters here, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So this is a great one for everyone to add to their watch list. And I know you're probably thinking, why are we talking about stocks when it's the second segment? Well, the reason <laughs> is because I want to really highlight for everyone what to look for. So yeah. we're looking for these run-ups, uptrends from the bottom. And we're going to now we're going to start looking for those first uh, stage bases. Now, there is going to be overhead and it's it's all going to happen where those lines are that Arusha drew. Yeah. But, but we know that. So we know what to expect and we can be prepared and uh, plan our positions accordingly. And so to be clear, you're not you're not really getting interested in it as it's coming up off the bottom. And again, it was that, that a lot of these stocks were coming off the bottom and that was driving 
a lot of the the movement in the indexes, um, you know, a lot of this bottom fishing, the China stocks that were coming off the bottom and so on. But you're you're really kind of waiting for it to do that advance and then pause and make a traditional base. Absolutely. So oh, patience absolutely. here. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could call that, I guess, a, a bottoming base, but it doesn't really have a name. It's kind of like a nothing, but it is like a consolidation. So if you saw some tight action, I mean, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't balk it for someone, you know, already trying it. Um, but I feel like it's less risky to, to now wait for a more constructive base pattern. Yeah. And here, here's an IPO that it came out with, uh, didn't necessarily have earnings initially, but now looks like it's starting to get some earnings yeah. and becoming more of an institutional quality type of stock. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, let's go ahead and shift over to shift four. Uh, ticker symbol here is F-O-U-R. And this was another one of those that, I mean, you, you almost wonder, is this what Mobileye has ahead of it? You know, because this was such a great right. advance here that it had. Um, really kind of held its 10 week moving average line for the most part, it would dip underneath there, but you know, would quickly come back. And then again, the bear market really kind of uh, took, took this one, took this one down. So we have a little bit of a base here that it formed at the end of 2022. Was that enough? Uh, you, you had the advance and then a little base. Was that enough here for, for shift four? You know, this is one I kind of wish I had purchased uh, most recently at that base that was created there um, around the 40 week line. Mm -hmm. And I saw it, I saw it every week and I just kind of, I didn't go for it. I don't know why. So it's, it's not, well, one it was that hard I, in that market environment. Yeah, it was hard in that market environment. I mean, I knew what it had done before, so I probably should have taken more um, in, that more of that into consideration, but now it's, you know, it's pulling back right with the market. So if it can build another little base, this will probably one I'll put, you know, closer to the top of my watch list. And this is just an example of a stock that that had a very nice run. And, you know, really at this point, I wouldn't necessarily put it in that IPO category. It's it's a mature stock that had a great run. Okay. Um, you know, you you could call this some due diligence or just you know some basing after after the fact. Um, and you know, will it be one of those stocks that that does come back? You know, it does have um, the earnings and some sales and it's got a nice little run off the bottom, which some don't you can't even get that far. So I think this is one you have to kind of put at the top of your watch list for those reasons. And and to be clear, I mean, Bill O'Neill, when he was talking about, you know, looking at newer merchandise, I mean, he was he was saying eight years, you know, IPO within the last eight years. And he actually ended up lengthening that a little bit um, like 15 yeah. or something right? oh, yeah. he did. Yeah. He, well, well he, he he did and the reason was because um you know so many of these great stocks you know i mean they they topped in 2000 but then they kind of had a resurgence you know the ones that worked had a resurgence and so he kind of lengthened that and said okay you know what you know i'm, I'm gonna use i'm gonna use 12 15 years now because yeah the stocks that you know the amazons the netflixes right. um, right. you know and and those uh he, he just felt like they they were they were worth kind of giving another shot in that ipo um era uh so uh let, let's go ahead and round out this segment with a, a look at toast and i know this is one that you've um, brought up before i think you brought this up on ibd live uh ticker symbol here is t-o-s-t -T. so you've got uh another credit card payment processor, you know, kind of like with shift four payments. Um, so what's what's different about this one? Well, I brought this one up a lot of time because I, I like what the company does. Mm -hmm. I see it at all the restaurants that I'm eating at. They have their little toast terminals and such. Right. Um, it doesn't have earnings. And that may be one of the reasons why, you know, it's, it's been struggling. I mean, it's it's pretty much had just, a you know, well, you see the decline. I don't need to yeah. think of Line. So it's in this due diligence phase. Um, it looked promising uh, two weeks ago, and then it didn't do well on earnings. And and that's okay, though, because, you know, if I think about Twilio, which I've shared with you guys before mm -hmm. and others, you know, that one has some, I mean, it had a, it had a long sideways due diligence, and it, it just wasn't ready. It looked like it was ready. It had a big gap up bar, and it just wasn't. So this could still be like a whole nother year. But I wanted to highlight it because I know everyone. Well, you keep saying this is you know this is one. Well, I like the company, but mm -hmm. you know, just because I like the company doesn't mean it's going to work. 
but I'm going to keep my eye on it. I mean, maybe it still stays, still stays, still stays tight for a while. Um, and you know, like we were talking about early, it, it, this is one of those ones that might need earnings to actually mm -hmm. get it going. Revenue is just not enough to convince, um, you know, funds to really invest in it. It only still, it only has one in the old fund right now. And so it'd be nice if it had some more and, and we'll see, but I, look at what I want to reinforce is that I'm looking at these every week because you never know when something's going to change. And yeah. right now it's got that ugly bar. So it's going to take a while, but I'm always keeping my eye on it because you never know. Yeah. yeah I mean, this is a, I'll, I'll, this is a, a, just such a new area. I mean, it just seems like in this whole payments area, there are a lot of newer IPOs that, that have come out in the last few years. So it, it, there are going to be a few winners and, and a lot of others that probably will get gobbled up. And it seems like at least Shift 4 might be one of those winners because that, that at least is getting some earnings and they're, and they're doing well. And may, maybe Toast is a, a, another one of those down the line. But I think the, the, the big key here is that even though Kathy liked it, she still let the stock and her yeah. rules tell her when it get out and because in the end, the market's right. Yeah, the technical action is so important, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I and did try it. I did try it, and then mm -hmm. I had to sell it. So, yeah. mm -hmm. but the yeah. end, that's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not hurt. Yeah, and <laughs> especially when you were doing those smaller positions, um, and you're also recognizing that okay, while it does have those uh, those great revenue growth numbers, um, you know. 2018 to 2021, that's kind of when you could get away with revenue growth and no earnings. And, uh, you know, now that's that's not necessarily the case anymore. So, uh, they, you know, people people uh, are a little bit more picky about uh, how their earnings are. So uh, when we come back, we're going to take a look at a few more stocks that are on Kathy's watch list. Those were kind of our, our examples uh, for uh, kind of getting these concepts down. But we'll talk some more stocks that are on Kathy's radar uh, when we come back. Stay tuned. The Direction Hydrogen ETF offers exposure to the top 30 pure play hydrogen economy companies by largest market capitalization, leading the way towards net zero emissions by providing more accessible, efficient, sustainable solutions across five hydrogen related sub themes. With clean hydrogen based energy expected to grow five times in the next 30 years, companies building hydrogen related businesses to generate power, heating, transportation, and more will likely thrive. Okay, welcome back to the Investing with IVD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, along with uh, my weekly guest, Arusha Pires from O'Neill Global Advisors. He's a portfolio manager over there. And our special guest this week is Kathy Donnelly. She is from the co-author of The Lifecycle Trade. And also, I just want to throw out her Twitter handle. Uh, you know, she, she often is posting things and, you know, what's, what's happening, what's on her radar. So you can find her at KGD underscore investor so uh check out that twitter handle if you if you are so inclined but let's go ahead and take a look at a few stocks um oh you know what one other thing i wanted to mention is, seminar, is right? yeah that you've got a a webinar that you're going to be participating in with trader lion uh our friends over there uh, ross haber richard moglin and, and those guys um an ipo master class and so your segment is going to be uh this this saturday uh is that correct yeah, that's that's correct. Thanks for for mentioning it. Uh, yeah, we, the co-authors and I, we decided to partner with Trader Lion on an IPO masterclass, and so it's a it's a seven part series, and you don't have to watch it live. You can watch it anytime, and it's it's yours forever uh, if you decide to participate. Yeah. And my special segment is actually this Saturday, and I'm going to be really going down deep and showing you exactly how I build a position of a real stock that I traded, mm -hmm. uh, super growth stock specifically, and uh, how I manage it. So it's going to be really exciting. And then each of the co-authors will have also an individual segment. And then we do a really good deep dive of the book as well. So hopefully, uh, if you want to check it out, uh, sign up, come see me live this weekend or, or anytime. And mm -hmm you know, hopefully make you a better IPO investor. It definitely helped me and my co-authors. So yeah, thanks, Justin, for bringing it up. It's been really fun and, and exciting. And even I've learned a lot just about myself. And because when you have to, you know, teach it to somebody else, <laughs> right. it really forces you to write those things down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Pre preparation. And yeah, it, it's funny because for a long time, you know, with uh, with people that were speaking, you know, along with Bill, when he was doing the, the workshops and stuff, he's like, you know, you, 
you should be doing this for free because you're you're getting plenty out of this. It's going to make you a better trader and uh, you'll get bigger bonuses and everything like that. So, um, but yeah, let's go ahead and get into some stocks. And uh, you wanted to start with on on, which of course is uh, you, you you have some of these shoes, don't you, uh, Arusha? Yeah, I, I'm I'm a big fan. Of, I've become a really big fan of of, of the shoes. So, uh, are, are are you running? Are you? Uh, I am not running. I walk. You... That what walking is now the the extreme exercise for me. But, yeah, okay. but I but <laughs> walking I, is I, I'm able to walk a number of miles and I don't feel anything on my feet. And uh, yeah, I, I I'm been pretty pretty uh, surprised at how how good they are. So I don't know. Really if, I mean, like Kathy, I know you, you you're a uh, it, yeah, I mean, you you do a lot of events and things like that. Do you use these sneakers? Yeah, well, I thought Justin was going to ask me, and he asked you, and I don't. <laughs> well, I, 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 was, podcast, I was starting Kathy. with Arusha, and then I was going to go to you, Kathy. Don't, don't feel Well, no, now. just because, I, you know, because most people know I do Ironmans, and so, yeah, right. so I do a lot of swimming, biking, and running, so that's why I just thought. But, no, I'm glad you asked Arusha uh, first because i, so, I mean so clearly on running appeals to both types of athletes the non-athlete <laughs> and an athlete like you right kathy yes. so, so do, you, do you have your own on shoes uh too i don't so okay. i am um, i'm actually a zero drop shoe okay. person so i that? like so basically that means that the heel is the same height as the the forefoot oh, so there's no heel raise yeah. and most most running shoes have heel raises and and on does as well yeah um but you know, that it was whatever works for you. Uh, so no, I don't. I don't own a pair of these, but I'm happy to hear that Arusha likes them. Uh, my friend Eve has a pair. She likes them. I have some other friends that really like them. Mm -hmm. And being in the Ironman circuit, uh, they just signed on a lot of top uh, winners from past Ironmans. You know, professionals uh, to be on sponsors, and so, and 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 they apparently really like them too. And it's got some earnings. It's got some sales. And I wanted to bring this one up because this one isn't as deep as some of the ones uh, that we saw, right? Mm -hmm. And there hasn't been that much time. It's not even a year and a half old. And it's a, good, a nice little cup with handle forming here. Um, so this is one that's on the top of my list. I do not have a position, but if it were to break out um, past that handle buy point, I likely will, will do so. And we've got some O'Neill funds in here. So, so this is definitely one on the top of my list um, for a potential new position. Mm -hmm. And that initial, you know, that initial move that it had back in 2021, um, what what kind of context does that give you uh, when when it starts like that? Now, granted, again, a lot of things went down. We've we've seen this pattern uh, over and over where the bear market was bringing everything down. But does that does that earlier move um, give you more confidence, or is it just you know it does what it does? Well, this pattern we would call late bloomer because it did have that initial run up before going into this due diligence phase that it's in now. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say that it gives me any additional confidence. Um, it just tells me that like most, mo this is actually one of the most common patterns, life cycle patterns, the late bloomer. Mm -hmm. And the thing I like is that is good about this one is that it's not a pump and dump meaning it didn't just go straight down like Facebook yeah. initially, you know, was a pump, pump and dump. Mm -hmm. um, Bumble is kind of one that was like a pump and dump. So there's not going to be as long as the due diligence phase isn't that deep, there's not going to be as much overhead resistance. So mm -hmm. from that perspective, I do prefer it. Um, unless it were a stock, if it had gone up a hundred percent or more in that initial run, I would, and, and not as deep um, of a decline, like we saw in upstart, I would give it even more credibility because it was able to have such a powerful IPO advance phase. Mm -hmm. But otherwise I would just say, oh, it's just, it's a late bloomer. It's not too deep. I, I don't put as much stock into it, um, but just recognizing it in that way. It just lets you categorize it and kind of have, have a built up uh, precedent for it because you've seen. Exactly. That before. All right. Perfect. Um, yeah. Anything else on this one before we move on? Um. No, I mean, I, okay. I will just highlight, you know, it's well, real quick. Yeah, just the highlighting the 40 week line. It's above the 40 week line. I mean, uh -huh. that's definitely ideal to have, you know, I mean, the majority of it is below the 40 week line. But, you know, you could also say that's a prior run up and maybe it builds a little flat base that handle. Yeah. Flat base. So um, there's lots of ways to look at it. So from that perspective, too, I find it um, positive. The RS line, I think, could be a little bit better, but, uh, you know, we'll see. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, so this is a, a stock that a lot of folks have been uh, 
taking a look at in the chip area, ALGM, um, you know, it seems like there were a lot of stocks that began with A in the chip area that were just uh, <laughs> doing really well. It was like, a, uh, yeah, just put put A in front of your name. But this this had, you know, certainly, I mean, it, it had that initial move mm -hmm. um, at the end of 2020 and mm -hmm. it kind of didn't do much, but it also didn't have that severe downtrend. It was kind of going back and forth around its 40 week line. So looking very different from a lot of your earlier examples. Yes. And this one I would still classify as a late bloomer because it did have that initial run up and then it went mm -hmm. sideways. But this is just an example of an institution diligence phase, as you pointed out, that really didn't have a fierce decline. I mean, it's it's wide, but it's not like super deep and it never undercut that first weekly bar. So that's also very positive, which many of them did eventually oh, they just eventually undercut the whole entire structure. Right. Um, I do have a position in this, so I need to disclose that. I do as well. I should disclose. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> great. Uh -huh. We're on the same page. Uh -huh. um, and Arusha, why don't you draw a line from that previous high when it um, had that initial run from the IPO? Over here. Uh, well, that's okay. I was thinking a little bit more to the left, but either way, mm -hmm. I think it's about the same. Yeah, so yeah. it's about the same. Um, so this one is past the turbulent zone. We haven't really talked about turbulent zone. Turbulent zone is a a term we coined for that prior high from the IPO, because usually what happens is the due diligence phase is way below that turbulent mm -hmm. zone. And so the first mature base will normally form, you know, below that turbulent zone and then start to build bases and then have a little bit of struggle when it gets to that line. And this one so far has broken through it nicely. You know, that earnings helped it out. And now it's, you know, correcting pretty nicely for the most part. Uh, we'll see, right? It's still early. Um, but yeah, this is one that's working. So maybe it creates a secondary buy point. And Urusha, you were highlighting all those blue bars. I mean, there's been great accumulation just all on that right side of that cup. And then you had the big bar that went with earnings. So so we'll see. We've got some O'Neill funds in this one too. But this is an example of a rare one that doesn't have any overhead that yeah. appears to be working. So Fingers mm -hmm. crossed, I guess. <laughs> well, it's, <laughs> it's been pretty, it. it's been pretty orderly over the last few months. So, I mean, that initial run up uh, for the, the right hand side of the cup, the latest cup, pretty orderly. A lot of Just weeks every up in a row. Week, yeah, every week. It was like eight weeks in a row. Came back, actually went sideways for a few weeks, uh, tight there, finding support on the 10 week line, and then kind of exploded up for kind of a neck, next leg up. So, been pretty and also while a lot of stocks over the last few days have come in really hard this one has uh really held up quite well so it's been pretty impressive mm -hmm. yeah the rs line looks really good yeah. Yeah. so this is definitely a, a super growth stock potential mm -hmm. we'll see and uh this is one that does have uh does have earnings i mean it's got some strong earnings growth numbers uh and revenue growth uh eps rating of 99 so it's it's certainly not one of those that you have to worry about. Oh, it's only got revenues and not earnings. I mean, there's some there's some strong earnings growth there as well. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's go ahead and round out the discussion with a software name. This is Double Verify. DV is the ticker symbol here, and uh, th this kind of looks a little bit more like some of the others that we've um, been looking at. Had that kind of initial run up uh, into into highs. Everything was looking good in in 2021. And then that bear market, you know, pulled this down. But now most of this recent base has formed above that 40 week line. Yes. And um, yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out. So this is another example of a late bloomer, a recent IPO, just barely over a year and a half old. And, um, you know, I, I know a lot of us were watching it. And actually, I remember specifically uh, John Boyk, I believe, was your guest. You guys talked mm -hmm. about this one because he was watching it when I was watching it when it first crossed over the 40 week line there to the left. But it didn't work. And like he said, and, and like I did also, you know, we had to sell because it just yeah. wasn't acting right anymore. So that's OK. You know, there's a, a right time for all the stocks. Now it's given us another base cup with handle. So we have another opportunity. Maybe now is the time we're going to see, right? Will the market support it? You've got some O'Neill funds in there. You've got some blue bars in there. And look how it pulled back in that cup on really below average volume, those red bars. Yeah. Yeah, right there. 
Um, now the key here is they are reporting earnings next week, right? So, uh, is that next week? Okay. Yep. Yep. Well, then there you go. It's either going to catapult it up or maybe not. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of amazing over the last four weeks how tight it's gotten. Yeah. 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 I, it, it's kind of rare to see a, a handle like that. So, so I think mm -hmm. that's pretty impressive. And, and you can look at it on the daily as well, and you can just see that it's 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 got a nice shape to the the cup with handle. Um, you know, the, the, the cup is a little deep at 37%, but not excessive. Usually when it gets, a, you know, over 40%, that's a little bit more worrisome. Um, but certainly the handle being at just 8%, um, you know, I, I personally like to see, see that kind of tighter action, uh, you know, come, come on down the road. And this, for as much as the, the market has gotten a little bit more volatile, this seems like it's holding up pretty well. Yeah. Uh, well, Kathy, yeah. great having you on the show as always. Uh, again, I'll be I'll be flying out, going to your neck of the woods. Maybe we uh, maybe we meet up for dinner or something like that if uh, we got some time and the the weather's not too bad. If I can stomach <laughs> uh, being out in that kind of cold, uh, but uh, you of course you've got that IPO masterclass with TraderLine coming up this Saturday, February twenty fifth. Uh, so folks can sign up for that. They can also take a look at your book that you've co-authored, The Life Cycle Trade, to get a lot of these concepts down. Um, again, you, you categorize things really well uh, with your co-authors uh, and, and have a lot of statistics to kind of share so that people have some direction. Uh, and then, of course, there's following you on Twitter at KGD uh, at uh, underscore investor. So that's another place that people can get you, uh, get, get your insights on a regular basis. So thanks again for being with us. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Thanks, Arusha. It was great to be here. I hope everyone was able to, to take something away. We did a lot of chart analysis, which, you know, I think is always really helpful. So mm -hmm. I wish you all the best of luck. And um, one other thing, if I'm also on LinkedIn. I just share that. Oh, okay. A lot of mm -hmm. people like to reach out to me on LinkedIn. So yeah. that's another way uh, you can follow me. And if you want to send me a message, uh, I'm happy to respond as, there as well. Awesome. And, and where, 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 uh, where do they find you on LinkedIn? Uh, just Kathy Donnelly. Just Kathy Donnelly. <laughs> just, just that easy. Okay, perfect. Wasn't sure if you used any. Uh, well, because because you know we're we're on Duolingo together. You're the one that got me on Duolingo, and you high fived me the other day, which I didn't even knew, know it was you. I couldn't see your picture. I didn't have my glasses on or something. I don't know. They're very small. But <laughs> thanks, thanks so much for being here. Uh, uh, always a pleasure, Kathy. Thank you. Okay. And on our show next week, we're going to have John Najarian. Now, John, he's been doing a lot of stuff, uh, you know, in Europe and going back and forth. So we are going to have our show a little bit different next week. Um, we're going to be taping that on Monday. It's going to drop on Tuesday. So be prepared for that. Uh, thanks so much for joining us this week. We'll see you next time. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.